Well, good morning, First Church, and welcome to our brand new series called The Bucket List. And I'm so excited about this series. A bucket list is a list of things that you want to do before you kick the bucket, which means die. Uh, and uh, I'm excited about that. It's supposed to help you live a better life. Um, but I'm just passionate about this. It matters a lot to me personally. Um, when my wife and I first started dating, she was startled by how obsessed I was with maximizing every moment and making every part of our lives contribute to a greater purpose. And uh, the things that I'm going to be teaching you for the next four weeks are things that I am just really passionate about. If you see me a little bit more hyped up than usual, like that's because I really believe in what I'm going to bring to you today. This is, this is something that just matters so much to me. If I could give my children just one lesson besides love Jesus, it would be the wisdom in this series. And uh, specifically, I tell my kids all the time, don't waste your life. I know that that sounds harsh, but I want them to think all the time, am I wasting my life in what I'm doing? Is this a waste of my life? I want us to ask that question. You see, a bucket list is a tool that's designed to help us not waste our lives. And I'm so passionate about this too because, you know, I'm, I'm getting close, you know, to middle age, right? And it's not that long until I turn 40 and I just started thinking about all the ways that I've wasted parts of my life. I mean, I remember in middle school really wanting a pair of Janko jeans. It's like, Why? Why? I mean, I look at those. Those are clown pants, you know, and yet that's what we wanted. I mean, those were so cool. Anybody remember Janko jeans? Yeah. Anybody own a pair of Janko jeans? Yeah. Yeah. Some of you are like, yeah, I see. Yeah, no. Yeah, maybe I did. Okay. Um, after Janko jeans, I remember in college, it was skinny jeans and we had to buy women's skinny jeans because they didn't make men's skinny jeans. Right. Um, but we put those on and then it was ripped jeans. And now we're back to wide legs again. I actually pulled out a set of high school wide legs because I was like, oh, they're back in style again. Perfect, right? So that's what I'm wearing today. That's great. I remember getting obsessed with different forms of social media, thinking this is the way that we're going to have influence in the future, right? So I put a ton of time into Facebook. Oh, yeah, this is a future. Facebook. It's going to be, Facebook's going to be huge, right? And after Facebook, it was Instagram. Facebook's nothing. You know, Facebook really matters. And then it was Vine. <laughs> Vine is going to, Vine's going to change the way we communicate. Then Vine shut down and it was Snapchat. I love Snapchat, right? The problem with Snapchat is they released an update six months ago that came from hell itself. It's terrible. So then Instagram came back, right? And now it's Instagram all over again. I'm not saying these things are bad, but here's the problem is we spend a lot of time on these things. And, and do we ever evaluate, like, is this what I want to do? Is this bringing me to the place I want to go in life? Life is short. I want to make the most of it. I mean, don't waste your life. I think this issue was really brought to light for me the other day. I, uh, I was watching my wife lead something. And most of my life, like, I'm in charge, right? I, do, I, I make the decisions. I set the tone. I say, here's where we're going to go. Here's what we're going to do. My wife was in charge. And so I was watching her lead. And, and it was really, it was hard because I had to sit there watching her while I wasn't doing anything for hours. And that's hard, right? I mean, uh, when I was 20 years old, I could sit there and, and watch people do things without, like, wanting to die. But now that I've had a cell phone in my hand for the last 10 years, it's like I always, always can distract myself with something, you know? And she was just leading, and, and I was like, Eesh. ever since the smartphone came out, I don't think I've ever had a moment of quiet time. I'm always reading something, you know? I never used to have my legs fall asleep while I was in the bathroom, right? But now many of us, we've had that experience, like... My, my latest phone is now waterproof, which has absolutely revolutionized the way I take showers because I will read news articles in the shower. I, brought, I bought pump shampoo so I can pump the shampoo, put it in my hair while holding my phone, continuing to read, right? I mean, that's what I do. And I realized, like, this is getting a little ridiculous, isn't it? And here's the problem. Here's the problem is, is I just realized when I was watching my wife lead and, and obviously focused on what she was saying but also focused on this thought process, um, I was thinking, like, wow. I have not evaluated my decisions and life choices in a while. Like, this is kind of surprising. I mean, I don't know if you're like me, but I wake up in the morning, and it is like go time. Like, I wake up late, right? And I'm just going as quick as I can to do things as quickly as I can, and I'm accomplishing stuff, and I'm changing diapers and throwing children and just going, going, going. And I never really think about what I'm doing. I just do it, right? And why am I doing these things? Right? I mean, I guess everybody else is doing, you know, Pop Warner and Upwards and Little League and, and traveling this, and I got to put on track stacking. And what's track stacking? It's maintenance free, but I got to do the maintenance of taking out the old deck to put the new deck on. And everybody else is remodeling and shiplap, 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 subway tile, kill me, Joanna Gaines, stop it. You're, you're, you're ruining my life, right? And I see people's Instagram story of like concrete countertops, and I'm like, wow, it's just concrete? You just pour that on there, you can have that. And look at those light fixtures. Maybe Chrissy and I, Chrissy, maybe we need to do something here. I don't know. Let's, let's just do it. When was the last time? You thought about all the things that you're doing. I mean, because we're busy. But when did you really evaluate your life choices and think, is this what I really want to be doing? When was the last time you stopped for 15 minutes without a TV, 
without a radio, without music, without your phone, without a computer, and you just really thought, why am I doing all these things? Are these things really valuable? I think this is so critical to talk about. Because in 2018, there's a lot of us. We're doing a lot. We're busy, but is it really bringing us the things that we really want? Don't waste your life. Don't waste your life. This series is all about taking a moment to hit the pause button and looking at our life's work. A bucket list is a tool that helps us make sure we don't waste our lives. It helps us uh, think in advance about what we're doing, and it helps us really do things that matter. Now, I've seen great bucket lists, and I've also seen poor ones. You see, in my job, I have a pretty poignant insight into the way that people live. You know, I, I, I go see people when they're dying. And I've walked into a lot of rooms, you know, where somebody's in their what I call final sleep. You know what I'm talking about when somebody's snoring really deeply and you know they're not going to wake up from this particular sleep. They're on their way to die. And sometimes you'll walk in the room and you'll see the family surrounding this person. You just know in your heart, this was a life well lived. This was a life that is complete. There was, this was a good life. And you just feel it. You know it. And there's sadness, but there's also joy that the sun is setting on a life well lived. Then there are other rooms I walk into and I just feel anguish and sadness because the sun is setting on a wasted life. I've seen it. I've seen it. It's one of the most difficult things to watch. Listen, not everybody gets 80 years, but I know a lot of 80-year-olds who have lived less than 18-year-olds, right? Just the same year on repeat, 80 times. They haven't lived 80 years. They've just lived the same year, 80 times over. You go to the same places, you celebrate in the same way with the same silver war, set the same way, and you bring the table out, and you set it just like this, and you bring the same people over, and you talk about the same things in the same way with the same presence and the same card and the same stuff, and it's just the same, same, same. You don't love anybody any more deeply. You haven't learned anything any else in any other way. You haven't learned to love the world or see other people's perspectives in deeper ways. Your, your emotional maturity is the same level that it's always been. There's no growth. It's just the same year over and over and over again. Don't waste your life. I just want to challenge our church in this series. I want to teach you how to make a great bucket list and maximize every moment, whether you're 18 years old or 80 years old. I think there's time to make the most of the years that we have left. I want to see you change the world. Think about it. Jesus' ministry lasted three years, and he changed the world in three years, right? If you don't have that much time left, you can still be a world changer with your life. For the next four weeks, we're going to look at Jesus' bucket list. And you don't have to be a Christian to know that Jesus is the most positive human in history, right? I mean, uh, on an archaeological level, it's a fantasy to say Jesus of Nazareth didn't exist. No human has ever done more good for the human endeavor than Jesus of Nazareth. And even though he only lived for 33 years, there's so much in our life today that he brought to us from hospitals and caring for the sick and doctors and science and modern medicine to love, monogamy, marriage. These are all things that Jesus gave to the world that were huge, peace-bringing, stabilizing influences, all because of Jesus. The reason why women and children are not slave, is like viewed at the same level as slaves and cattle today is because of the teachings of Jesus. If you look around the world, at different countries, the ones that have had the teachings of Jesus as a part of their history value women and children, and the ones that have not do not, right? I mean, that's just, you don't need to, it's not, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see the way that Jesus has blessed your life. And you might be in here today, and you might be like, well, I don't believe in Jesus. Listen, ladies, you would not have a voice in society were it not for his influence, right? So even if you don't believe in him, you've been blessed by him. And uh, this week is going to be a little bit different because to make a great bucket list, you can't just start putting things on there willy-nilly. Um, Jesus had a, uh, some guidelines and pre-existing thought patterns that allowed him to make a great bucket list. And the next three weeks are all going to be about the actual items on Jesus' bucket list. But this week is going to be about that one pre-existing rule so that we can make a great bucket list just like Jesus and uh, today, I really only have one main point, but this is such a classic pastory thing to do. I've really only got one main point, but I have three sub points to support it, so <laughs> that's what I'm doing. Um, listen, uh, my points are contained in this passage called John chapter 3, verses 14 through 17. John is a specific book in the Bible written by this guy named John, um, who I am named after, and um, it's a, it's a great book in the Bible. I just want to remind you, the Bible is not one big book. It's a collection of 66 books bound into a bigger collection. So you don't read, you know, from one end of a library shelf to the other. You don't read the Bible from cover to cover. You go to the book that, you know, is pertinent to what you're talking about. And a lot of times people ask me, John, why the Bible? 
You know, I mean, come on. It's, uh, it's, it's ancient book and copies of copies, and how can it possibly? And listen, this is the best preserved book in all of antiquity. We have no other book from antiquity that is better preserved than the Bible. We have 500 times more ancient manuscripts of the Bible than all the ancient manuscripts of Plato, Aristotle, Julius Caesar, and Shakespeare combined. Right? Now, um, you don't really doubt the life and works of Julius Caesar, but there's far more evidence for the life and works of Jesus of Nazareth than Julius Caesar. Right? I mean, there's a pretty good amount of evidence. This isn't like blind faith. There's a preponderance of evidence behind this. We have the corroborated eyewitness account of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection in a way that's pretty incredible. Jesus never asks for blind faith. Always. He shows us signs, wonders, and miracles so that we can have informed faith. I know some of you are like, but, but John, like, so, so Jesus existed and he did great things, but I mean, come on, supernatural, please. Supernatural is easy to believe in, right? I mean, I look at the Mona Lisa and I'm not like, okay, so, you know, I think that actually what happened here was lightning came from the heavens and it struck sand and it emulsified the sand, which then was splashed up onto a spontaneously generated canvas with perfect chiaroscuro and, and it was a masterpiece that would define artwork for centuries to come and it happened by, there's no artist, it just happened, right? No, that's ridiculous. Obviously, obviously, there's a master behind the masterpiece. And I look at our planet, I look at our universe, and it's clear to me, because it's far more complex than the Mona Lisa, that there's a master behind the masterpiece. Like, it's just not that God exists, right? And by far, the most positive force in human history is the God of the Christian Bible. And I just think that's pretty neat. So right now, I'm going to read some passages out of this book. I want to ask our church to stand out of honor for what this book has done. And I know it's a little bit unique. We don't normally do that. And again, you might not believe in Jesus. He might not be your total thing. But I want to remind you that even if you don't believe in him, as a matter of historic fact, this book has liberated and blessed more humans than any other book in human history. And that's pretty cool just to think about. So anyway, uh, here's what it says. And uh, it says, And as Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. It's a crazy verse. I'll explain it at the end, okay? Um, it says, So that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only Son, so that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Let's pray. Jesus, I lift up this service to you. I ask that you would speak in and through me. I ask that you would use this message by the power of your spirit to move in our hearts. Lord, I pray that this would not just be an emotional moment, but this would be the beginning of a transformation in each of our lives, that we wouldn't just follow you for an hour on Sunday morning, God, but that we would follow your way and your best for our lives in every area. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As you're seated, greet the person next to you and say, you look great today. I said, you look great today. I didn't say, hey, how's it going? How are you doing? Yeah, oh, it's, uh, it's good. Listen, I got one key point today. I'm going to reveal it to you right now. My one key point is this. When you're making a bucket list, start with the end in mind. You start with the end in mind. That's good knowledge there. You see, when you want to accomplish something, you need to think about what you actually want to accomplish. What do you want your wife to look like at the very end? Without doing this, you can make a bad bucket list. I'm so embarrassed when I look back at my bucket list. When I was in seventh grade, we had an assignment to make a list of things we wanted to do before we died. At that time, the term bucket list didn't exist, but it was a bucket list. And uh, I look back at it, and it was almost laughable. On my bucket list, I had um, skydive. And I'm like, why? Why? It's so kitschy and cliche. Really, John? Did you think that among the things that would define your life, skydiving would like, be the best stop? Okay? I wanted to own a Siberian Husky. Now, a couple things about this. I don't like dogs. I'm allergic to dogs. And why would I buy a dog that looks like a wolf? Okay? All dogs don't like me. They're racist. They want to bite me. I don't know. Everybody's like, oh, yeah, my dog won't bite you. He's just the nicest dog. And then I come over and they buy, oh, he's never done that before. I'm like, well, your dog isn't very cultured. <laughs> I had on my bucket list I wanted to marry... Jamie Madeline. And I just, for so many reasons, thank God that he did not answer that prayer. Note, side note, sometimes God doesn't answer your prayer because you're asking for dumb things, okay? Um, not that Jamie was dumb. It's just, I don't know. My seventh grade mind really thought she was something special because she was just very developed and mature for her age. But anyway, um, another thing that I wanted to get was, and this is crazy, okay? It's 1994. Things were raging. The party was hot. And uh, I wanted to get a, a Tweety Bird Looney Tunes tattoo, Okay? Now, if you have one of these, I know that you can teach the next generation about how tattoos are permanent and all. But, I mean, Tasmanian Devil, Marvin the Martian, like, everybody got these, and they were on fleek at that time. But today, it's like, wow, hello. <laughs> I look at that list, and I just realize I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. And so I made a terrible bucket list. See, if you want to make a great bucket list, you have to start with the end in mind. And I see this problem in my children today. Okay? They live their life 
and they do a lot of things that they want to do, but they have no idea what they want the end to look like. My son, Eldon, two years old, okay, he's just totally savage, and uh, he, he pulls this monster truck off the shelf, right? He puts it on the ground, both his hands on it, and he just runs full speed as fast as he can with this monster truck directly into my ankles, right? And I, you know, I'm just, and I give him a look, Okay, I give him a look. I'm not proud of the look that I gave him, but I give him a look, and he immediately sees I'm going to die if I stay here, right? So he stands up. He throws the truck against the cabinetry in the kitchen and sprints to the other side of my house where he sees a bookshelf, and he just proceeds to sweep the books off the shelf. Just all of them, just, I'm like, what are you doing, right? Well, I know what he was doing. He was looking for the, the hungry caterpillar, and he couldn't find the hungry caterpillar because I've read it so many times that I decided to hide the hungry caterpillar in the garbage can, right? Because I'm done, Right? Well, he's looking for it, and he's throwing the books all around and, you know, saying, hungry caterpillar, you know, and he can't find it and whatever. So when he can't find it, he proceeds to um, get on a scooter, and he gets on the scooter, and he's going around the house. You know what he does? Rams directly into my ankles for the love. So he runs across the house, and he grabs his matchbox cars, and he picks them up. There's 50 to 60 matchbox cars inside of this bucket, and he takes the bucket, and he just dumps it all over the floor. Why, child? Why? What are you doing? You're going to make me commit murder here in a minute. And I see him look at all this stuff, and I just see him frustrated, right? He's looking around the house. The house is a mess because he made the mess. And he did a bunch of fun things, but he accomplished nothing of meaning, right? And he gets to this place, and I can see it on his face. He looks, he looks at the house, looks at the mess that he made with his own actions and his own choices, and I see him thinking. I can see it on his face. Wow, my life is a mess. I don't really like it here. And he did lots of things, but he didn't have a plan. His things were unrelated. He wasted his life, and he's no better for it. And here's the reality. I feel like so many of us are just adult versions of Eldon, right? We're just adult versions of my son. And uh, we play a little bit here. We play a little bit there. We just rip stuff off the shelves. We go on vacation, you know, to some exotic place. We dump our finances on the floor like a bunch of matchbox cars. We waste away years on expensive traveling sports that our kids don't really love that much, but they play because they see how much we want them to love it and how much we're spending on it. And it's like, <laughs> right? And then we get to this place where we look at our life just like Eldon, and we think, wow, our life is a mess, and I don't really like it here, Right? We have no goal. We never really thought about what we wanted the end to look like. We just did a bunch of things that we wanted to do in the moment that were unrelated. Don't waste your life. This is a great way to waste your life. I do a lot of premarital counseling, right? And I see the same mentality a lot of times, a lot of times, right? And uh, I'll, I'll ask the couple, this is a question I ask the couple, hey, what are your goals? Right? And because it's 2018, the bride will always cut off the husband and speak for him and say, you know, uh, we want to keep the wedding on budget. We don't want to fight with my mother. We want to pick the right colors for the ceremony. And I'm always like, ah. Lord have mercy, okay? And I say, no, 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 that's a wedding. But what about the marriage? Why are we spending more time and emotion and energy and money investing into a day when we're talking about our life together? Oh, pastor, I got that on lock, okay? (laughs) We're going to travel. We're going to get a house. We're going to pay off student debt. Hello, we're going to have fun together. That's what we want to do. I say, that's great. That's a great set of goals for three years. I love it. But but what about 60 years from now, okay? That's what I'm really asking. What are your goals for 60 years from now? (gasps) I never thought about that. Listen, everybody wants a happily ever after. But if you can't define what happily ever after is, how can you get there, right? I mean, if we never think about where the end is, how can we plan for it? How can we make a route that will get us to the end? I think so many of us are like Eldon. We're playing everywhere with no purpose, making a mess, and wasting our lives. Why would you start by asking, why would you not start by asking what you want the end to look like? I mean, when we build a building, what do we do? We make plans, right? Blueprints. Why? Because you're painting a picture, a virtual picture of what you want the end to look like. When you plan a trip, what do you do? You put the destination into Google Maps, unless you're a loser and use Apple Maps, right? Because that never gets us there. But anyway, you use Google Maps. You put the destination in there to get where you want to go. But with the biggest gift that we have, we have no plan. You'd be crazy to build a building without plans. You'd be crazy to try to get somewhere without thinking about how you're going to get there. And you'd be crazy to live a life without thinking about the end destination, wouldn't you? Yet so many of us do. Early in Jesus' ministry, like right at the start, there's this congressman named Nicodemus who comes to Jesus at night and talks to him in John chapter 3. And he looks at Jesus. He says, Jesus, how is your life going to be meaningful? Like, what are you doing that's going to make you, you know, be a move of God on earth? And Jesus actually paints a pretty clear picture. This is what our key passage today is talking about. And uh, Jesus' words clearly show at the start of his ministry that he knows what he wants the end to look like. And uh, in John 3, 17, we're going to start at the end because we're talking about the end in mind and work our way backwards, 16, 15, and 14. In 17, it says, God sent his son into the world not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. Jesus starts with the end in mind, and before his ministry even begins, 
right here, he's painting a picture of what he wants the end to look like. And he wants to save the whole world. And that's a big goal, but let's put that aside for a moment and just talk about how wise Jesus is for taking the time to know exactly what his happily ever after looks like. I mean, he could have just wandered around like a boss, healing people, you know, doing the moonwalk on the water, you know, just saying, I'm going to send it, right? Just, just send it, you know, hope I land, it'll be great. But, you know, he started with the end in mind, didn't he? He started with a clear end in mind. And today, I just want to challenge every person in here to go home and reflect on what you actually want the destination of the end of your life to look like. I mean, ask yourself some questions. What do you want, what do you want your memory to be like in the heart of your children? What do you want your marriage to look like when you're 75? What do you want your finances to look like at the end of your life? I think most significantly, what do you want your spiritual legacy to be? It's shocking to me how most of us really have no plan, right? We just have two kind of really side goals. Number one, don't go bankrupt today. And number two, don't die today. It's going to be a good day. Just hop on the old V-twin and take her off the jump. Let's hope I land it, right? I haven't even thought about or calculated if this is possible. Listen, I think we're so afraid, we're so afraid to think about death that we waste our life, right? Without accomplishing what we really wanted, I think so many of us, the sad reality is we watch our life pass us by without accomplishing what we really wanted. Don't waste your life. If you're going to make a great bucket list, you've got to start with the end in mind. Now, I've got three supporting points I want to talk about really quickly. Oh, yeah, I forgot to put that on there. And the first one is um, pick the end that matters most. I remember playing a game with a friend of mine. His name was Nathan. And uh, it was a game called Axis and Allies. I don't know if you've ever played it. It's a super nerdy game. There's like hundreds of pieces. You put them on the board and you like dominate the world and whatever. And I am like passionate about this because I have a problem with losing. I'm not very good at it, okay? All I do is win no matter what. And so I'm playing the game and I'm dominating the world. And after the game's over, I just see Nathan take all the pieces and he just swipes them off the board into the, the box. And I remember being horrified. I was like, what? what are you doing? I just put blood, sweat, and tears into this for two hours. And now it's just done? Like, we're just going to be done? We're just going to walk away from my victory? Is that it? And then he put the box on the shelf, and we never talked about it again. It was so interesting because that was like my passion in the moment, and then it didn't matter. I have a friend who's a farmer. He talks about, he's a retired farmer, and he talks about the stress of each season and what it would bring. He said, John, every year I used to bet the literal farm on crops, right? Some years we could have a great harvest, but, but commodity prices would be down. That's close to heart this year, right? And I'd, I'd lose it. He said, I worried every day about losing the legacy that my father and my grandfather put their life's work into building. He said, when I was a young man, John, I used to dream of having a farm of 700 acres. That was what a big farmer had was 700 acres. I just thought if I had 700 acres, it would mean so much. He said, one day, I surpassed 700 acres. I didn't even realize it because by that time, I wanted 1,000 acres. I wanted to be a four-figure farmer right? Have a thousand acres. That's what real men had, you know? Get a, get a six-row head on my combine and just be able to dominate the world and blah, 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 and all this stuff. He said, one day I passed a thousand acres. I didn't even realize it because by that time I wanted 1,500 because that's what you needed to support a family. You can't even support a family in America today without 1,500 acres. That's what you need to farm. And he said, one day I surpassed 1,500 acres and I didn't even realize it because by that time I wanted 2,000. He said, now I'm older and retired and I'm watching my farm get put back in the box Literally, my farm is just getting folded up. And, and, you know, it's not bad, whatever I get. It's part of life. But, John, you don't understand. This, was, this wasn't just a job. This wasn't just a hobby. This was my life. This was my way of life. This was everything. And, and it's over, and I'm just watching it get put away and put back. And what's it even mean? What's it all about? It's his life's work, and it doesn't even matter. Jesus was so discerning about what he put on his bucket list. He didn't just start with an end in mind. He picked the end that matters most. I think if a lot of us were not that careful, we'll pick ends that don't matter, right? Jesus, in his ministry, he said, for this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. See, Jesus' disciples wanted him to overthrow the Roman Empire and establish a great new empire and blah, 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 and be the emperor of the world and dominate the world. And They thought that was a pretty big end. And I'm not going to lie, that sounds like a big end. I mean, world domination, that's an that's a, you know, important thing. But Jesus had bigger vision than that. You see, Jesus knew that nations rise and fall, but the word of the Lord will stand forever. He said, I don't just want to bless people's life now. I want to bless people's eternity. That's the biggest thing that I can invest in. He knew that eternity was real. I believe Eternity is real. And I actually think eternity is the end that matters most. And I mean, the reason why I think that is because the Bible says so. And that's enough 
for me. Now, I know some of you, you're like, but I, I don't believe the Bible. Like, what about that? Well, I always say the Bible is confirmed with reality, right? I mean, we have the corroborated eyewitness account of tens of thousands of people who have had near-death experiences, the vast majority of which play into the perfect description of what the Bible tells um, us eternity is like. Years ago, if you remember, I rolled out on stage in a coffin to talk about eternity and the evidence that we have for it. And we have this book in the shop called Imagine Heaven that talks very clearly about it. What I think is amazing is there's lots of accounts of people who've had near-death experiences in Muslim countries who have never heard the name of Jesus who come out professing Christ, right? Even though they haven't been exposed to it. I mean, that's a supernatural documented miracle, right? I mean, I believe eternity is real because the Bible says so, but like you don't need to trust the Bible to know that the Bible is true, right? Pretty neat. Now, we have a multi-generational church this is statistically one of the most socioeconomically and generationally diverse communities in the country. And I just love raising my kids here because in the suburbs, oh, the suburbs are the worst for so many reasons. But, uh, you know, it's just always chasing after the Joneses and all this stuff. And I didn't even understand what a blessing it is to be a part of a community like this until I lived here. My friends are like, how do you live without Starbucks? And I'm like, man, I have such a satisfying and full life. I talk with older people in our church and uh, we actually have a really, really diverse and great group of senior citizens here. And, uh, you know, people who have been, you know, salespeople and farmers and business owners and builders and world changers, almost all of them gave sacrificially and significantly to build this building. I mean, they are the lion's share of the giving that allowed us to build this. And this is kind of interesting because almost all of them have shared with me that seeing God transform people's lives, not just, not just healing of depression and anxiety, not just healing of broken marriages, not just saving people from suicide, which we've seen many times over, but changing eternities. That's been one of the most meaningful experiences of their lives. One man told me specifically with tears in his eyes, he says, John, I've earned millions and I've done great things, but this is the, the best thing that I've ever invested in or been a part of. I want you to pick the end that matters most. When you're painting a picture of the end, I want you to think really hard. Does this really matter? So I think there's a lot of things that matter to us right now that aren't going to matter when we're 80 plus years old. I am so glad that I did not marry Jamie Madeline. I upgraded on every level. Hello, Kristen Walter. I'm so glad I didn't get a Tweety Bird tattoo. I mean, so glad, so glad. And look, what are the things that are important to us today? Surely a, a new kitchen would be nice for years to come. And, and world travel would yield great memories. And, and weekend tournaments will yield confident kids. But I want to ask you, when you're 80 years old, is that going to matter? Because it won't to me. When I'm 80, I'm not going to care about those things. The memories will be great. Confident kids will be great. But what I really dream of is great grandchildren who every single one of them knows and loves Jesus. They'll be with me in eternity in heaven. Because I think about it, I'm like, I'm not going to know my great grandchildren very long. But guess what? If they love Jesus, I'll know them for eternity in heaven, right? I mean, that's an end that matters. I care about seeing this community transformed through the ministry of this church and the gospel, right? I want to store up treasure in heaven. That's what matters. And this is what Jesus did and why he changed the world. He picked the end that matters most. My next step point is simple. You start small and you make every step count. It's hard to set up big goals because the mountain is intimidating to climb when you're at the bottom of it, right? You look at it and you're like, oh, how could I ever get up that? I mean, when Kristen and I first got married, I had some big problems in my life. Specifically, I had no filter. I don't know if, if you have friends in your life who just say things. Like, I just say things, right? I remember one time standing next to my then girlfriend, and I looked at somebody and I said, hey, how's it going? When, when, did you have the baby yet? Oh, you did? Wow. Doesn't look like it, right? I said that out loud. Oh, my goodness. I'm so sorry. Kristen was like, John, you have to stop, like, saying things, right? I said, I don't know if I can ever stop this, honey. I mean, this is just, this just happens. And she's like, no, 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 it's one step at a time. We're just going to start one step at a time. And you know what? She started celebrating the little things. Like, we'd walk by somebody and look like they were pregnant. She'd look at me, and I'd look at her, and I'd be like. <laughs> I think sometimes we get intimidated by the mountains we have to climb. But the only way to get to the top is starting with one small step. Don't waste your life at the bottom of a mountain living in fear, thinking I could never get there. You start one step at a time. Jesus made every step count, every little step. In verse 15, he says, so that every one, and I love that he says every one who believes in him will have eternal life. See, Jesus would be in a crowd of thousands of people. It would be overwhelming. How am I going to change the world? I mean, I want to save the whole world. That's my goal in this life. How could I possibly change the whole world? You know what he would do? He would start with one disenfranchised, forgotten woman. He'd bring healing to her life because every life mattered to him. And he said, the only way I'm going to change the world is one life at a time. 
He celebrated one poor, ignored woman being healed. He celebrated a prostitute finding freedom when nobody cared about the sex slave trade. Jesus was the first documented person that we know of to care for it. He celebrated children finding healing. He celebrated children's rights. Jesus made every part of his life matter. It was all part of a bigger goal. It was small step, one small step at a time, but it all contributed to a bigger goal. Whether it was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, whether it was a boat in a storm, or whether it was feeding people who didn't have food. His disciples were like, dude, why are we doing this? We got bigger plans than feeding people. And Jesus was like, hello, this is part of a bigger goal. It's one step at a time. It's scary to think about the next 60 years. So you break it down into small moments. You make a bucket list that has small steps to get you to the end that you want. When it comes to getting to the end that you want, every bucket list item should be linked to a greater goal. I think this is the secret to lives that change the world. If I take a bunch of Legos and I just throw them out all over the floor like my children love to do, right, little landmines that cut my feet, um, they're not going to get very high, right? And they don't get very high at all. It's just a bunch of Legos on the floor. But if I take every little brick and I just put one on top of the other on top of the other, I'm going to get really high, right? You make every goal on your bucket list part of a bigger picture. I think church sometimes get over-focused on bigger numbers. I don't care about the numbers. I care about every period one. We've got some intimidating goals as a church that do involve numbers, but I want to celebrate every one, one life at a time. I want to celebrate the family that came to me last week and said, John, Jesus through this church has saved our marriage, saved our eternities, and changed every part of our life. They said, John, we felt like our lives were full and okay before Christ, but we had no idea what we were missing out on until we went all in with Jesus, right? I want to celebrate that, and yeah, that's just one couple, but that's a huge deal because every number has a name, every name has a story, and every story matters to God. As you make your list, I want you to make sure that every point brings you closer to the end goal that you have. My wife always asks me before every visit, every dinner, every conversation, she says, John, what is our point here? I mean, in the morning, we'll talk to each other. Hey, what is, what is the goal here? What is the purpose of this day? And sometimes it's a little overwhelming to sit down with a meal with the kids, but she reminds me, hey, we are leading our kids to a relationship with Jesus at this dinner, right? It's intentional, it's purposeful, right? When I'm meeting with her, sometimes she'll tell me, John, make sure you are leading my heart to Jesus in this conversation. I'm grateful for that. The best lives, the best bucket lists, the best ends are reached. When you have a list that builds on itself, right? Every step counts, every small step. And I'm nowhere near, near where I want to be as a husband, as a father, and as a pastor. But it's easier to take one small step at a time when I look back and say, God, look how far you brought me. And the mountain's still far away. The peak is still a long ways away, but I'm taking one step at a time. Now, I hope these goals are meaningful to you, right? I want to review them with you just for a moment. You start with the end in mind, right? That's the big deal. That's the main point. You pick an end that matters most, and you start small, and you make every step count. These are, um, these are preconditions, I think, to making a great bucket list. And uh, before we get to the rest of this series, I want to ask every person in here to do this. I actually want you to, when you go home today, I want you to spend 30 minutes. You silence your cell phone. You put it in another room. I know that like, might be hard. You take off your Apple Watch. You shut your computer. You turn off your music. You take out your earbuds. You do whatever it takes, but you get silent and you take a moment to really write out, what do I want the end to look like? What do I want the end of my life to look like? I actually want you to pick an end that matters most. You evaluate that end that you're picking. You think, it, does this matter? I mean, is this really like, in, in light of God's promises, is this important? And then I want you to celebrate every little milestone. I want you to make sure that everything that you're going to put on that bucket list is contributing to that end that you've laid out. And I specifically want to call out men in the room today. See, I think God put the mantle of leadership on us, brothers husbands, fathers, okay? God has called you to lead your families in this, and I don't want your wife to be like, okay, honey, are you gonna do what pastor said? I want you to say, honey, we're gonna do this. We're gonna do this together. I wanna lay it out. We're gonna go first, then like individually, and then we're gonna come together and talk about the end we have in mind. I want you to do that. I'm challenging you. I'm, I'm, I'm asking you to consider doing that, to be leaders. See, I think so many men, we lament the lack of purpose in our lives and the lives of our families, yet it's our job to lead our families to that purpose. It's our job to create vision in our families' hearts. I dare you to do it. You don't have to be a Christian to be blessed by the wisdom of Christ. Even if you're not a Christian, I know you see the blessing in what I'm talking about right now. Now, I said there was a third sub-point, and some of you are like, but what about the third sub-point? I have blanks, and I need them filled in, and if he doesn't tell me this, what am I going to do? My life? What? I mean, I need these blanks, John. Okay, I'll get them to you. Okay, here's the last set of, of blanks that I have, and this is the most important point. I save the best for last because I think it really matters, but um, I want you to let God redeem suffering for our good. See, the reality is I think there are some of you here today who say, uh, John, I'm, I'm too hurt or broken to be used by God at this point in my life. I mean, I, I've already let two year, too many years pass me by. I, I can't do what it takes. Uh, I want you to know I think God calls every one of us to a life of significance. And I think God specializes in taking what the devil intended for evil and redeeming it 
for good. Don't waste your life believing that God can't redeem it. This is what I love about Jesus, is he made the worst moments of his life the most significant, the most meaningful, and what would be the most impactful. I mean, I think that's just amazing. That's what God does in the Bible. I love that every single time our enemy, the devil, he tries to destroy us, and then God just goes in there and he redeems it. See, the most meaningful verse in this whole passage is the one that speaks to wounded people, to people who are hurting, to people who are discouraged and disengaged, okay? And, and if you don't know your Old Testament, it probably doesn't mean much to you, but I'm going to give it meaning right now. You see, John 3, 14, it says, And as Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. And this is referring to a passage in the book of Exodus. The Israelites were in the wilderness. This is a thousand years before Jesus walked the earth, right? They're in the wilderness and, 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 and there's these snakes, these poisonous snakes that are killing people. Everybody's dying. It's terrifying, right? I mean, people are, are waking up in horror at the, at the idea of a snake in their room. I mean, it's nightmares. Um, so the Israelites were getting bitten and they were horrified at the image of snakes. And um, God said, hey, I want you to put a snake around a pole. I want you to lift it up. And when people look at that pole, they will be healed, Right? And, and, and I love that what the devil intended to kill them became a symbol of healing. You've probably seen the snake on a pole. It looks just like this, right? And uh, I know that Hermes tried to appropriate this, but the reason why ambulances have this on the side uh, as their logo is, is because of Moses. I love that God took a sign of terror and he turned it into an international sign of healing. See, Jesus is referring to this because at that time there was another symbol in the Roman Empire that was horrendously terrifying. It was horrific. Okay? I cannot under, or overstate how terrible this symbol was. People would see it and they would literally shudder and scream. This was a traumatizing symbol for people. It was, it was, it was the most vicious and horrendous symbol you could show. Okay? It was far worse than a noose, far worse than an electric chair, far worse than a gun, far worse than a skull and crossbones. It was awful. See, what it was was the image of a crucifix, a cross. People would be hung on a cross to die. Everyone would scream and shudder when they saw it. And Jesus said... I'm going to turn the image that everybody is afraid of into an international symbol of healing and peace and redemption. See, God took this symbol of death and he turned it into a symbol of life. I mean, you look at it today, the red cross, what is it? The symbol of healing, the national, international symbol of healing is a cross because that's the power of Jesus. He turned torture and death into a symbol of healing. Even the worst moment of his life became the best part of his purpose. A tool for torture and death turned into a moment of salvation and hope. And when we make Jesus our leader and forgiver, the thing that was intended to destroy him becomes the very cornerstone of completing his ultimate purpose in our lives. As we close, I want to ask you guys to stand right now. There are some of you, you're here today and you're in moments of pain, you're in moments of loneliness. You're in moments of disappointment. You're in moments of disengagement and distraction. I want you to know that God can turn the brutality and torture of Jesus' crucifixion into a moment of purpose. And if he can do that, he can take the pain in your life and he can turn it into a forge of purpose and healing. In Christ, the worst can become the very best. And God does not waste our hurt and pain. He redeems it and he uses it for our good and for his glory. See, the church of Jesus has always been a force for purpose and change and hope in the world. And I look at this church in 2018, and I say, we will continue to carry that mantle. In an age where everybody is distracted and disengaged, we're going to be a people of purpose, a people of determination. I see a church that will transform this community. See, we will stand at the frontier of the unknown, and we will be undeterred and unafraid because we serve a God of great calling and redemption. I want you to know you are not too far gone for God to use and heal and restore. I want us to be a place that fights for the destiny of God in our community. I want us to say we will not waste our lives. We're going to go, we're going to change the world. We will not go quietly into the night. We will be used by God for greatness. Pray with me. Jesus, use our church. Transform our church by the power of your gospel, by your mercy and grace. We invite you to bring healing. We invite you to use us, make our lives huge lives of purpose. Thank you for giving us meaning in this life. In your name we pray. All God's people said amen.